A great primary resource in understanding the landscape of Baldhead Island during the Civil War comes in the autumn of 1863 when Confederate military officials are laying plans and formulating ideas about the construction of Fort Holmes. There are two maps and they are drawn by a Confederate topographical engineer known as J.W. Blackford. He was a Virginian that served in the Army of Northern Virginia until the autumn of 1863 when he was detached to serve based out of Wrightsville Beach. Sometime that autumn he traveled down to Baldhead Island and produced two maps, one being a detailed image of Baldhead Island and another being a larger perspective that includes all the barrier islands known today as the Smith Island Complex. These maps are housed at UNC Chapel Hill. An illuminating feature of Blackford's map of Baldhead Island is a vast network of roads created by the Confederates across Baldhead Island. Some of these roads were established by 1863 when Blackford is drawing these maps and others are labeled as proposed roads. These roads were not only used to move soldiers across the length and the width of Baldhead Island, but additionally they were used by several units of mobile artillery pieces. These artillery pieces differ from the five batteries within Fort Holmes because Fort Holmes batteries were stationary. These are large seacoast cannons that are stationary in place on barbettes as opposed to these mobile artillery units that are on caissons or wagons. Another curious detail about Blackford's maps are the number of home sites on Baldhead Island during 1863. Uh, one may assume these are home sites of river pilots, these uh, men and women who are assisting vessels and navigating the Cape Fear River to the Port of Wilmington. But at least one of these home sites is labeled as T.M. Thompson. We can assume this is Thomas Mann Thompson Sr., the final lighthouse keeper of Old Baldy Lighthouse before the American Civil War breaks out. Thomas Mann Thompson Sr. would end up enlisting in the Confederate military and be detached to serve on Baldhead Island. The Old Baldy Foundation staff believes that if Thomas Mann Thompson Sr. is detached to serve on Baldhead Island in order to relight Old Baldy Lighthouse to be used as a navigational aid in assisting the Confederate blockade runners in locating and finding Old Inlet and the Cape Fear River's estuary into the Atlantic Ocean. Shortly after Thomas Mann Thompson is detached to serve on Baldhead Island, Union naval officials notice that Old Baldy once again is lit. Hey, welcome everybody to beautiful Baldhead Island. My name is Travis Gilbert. I'm the educator and collections coordinator here for the Old Baldy Foundation. We are the not for profit that is responsible for preserving and interpreting North Carolina's oldest standing lighthouse and the breadth of history here on Baldhead Island. So uh, when we talk about Fort Holmes and the Civil War here on Baldhead Island, I always like to begin with Old Baldy Lighthouse. So you see, in 1852, the U.S. Lighthouse Board published their first annual report. And in that report, they have nothing nice to say about Old Baldy. First of all, she was supposed to be a seacoast light. She was supposed to warn mariners about the dangerous spot frying pan shoals extending off of Cape Fear. And Old Baldy was too short at 110 feet, and she was way too dim to properly warn mariners of those dangerous waters off of Cape Fear. Additionally, she was not located in the proper area of the island to warn mariners of those dangerous shoals. So a few years later, a bright young captain in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers comes down here and designs a brand new 
second order 150 foot lighthouse to replace Old Baldy. This was going to be an adequate lighthouse to warn mariners about frying pan shoals. And you gotta wonder, who is this bright young engineer? His name is William Henry Chase Whiting. The guy that, you know, designed Cape Lookout Lighthouse up outside of Beaufort. Well, he's the man right before the Civil War that is laying these foundations to knock down Old Baldy and build a brand new, larger, more adequate lighthouse. They get as far as to design this new lighthouse, and in the summer of 1860, Congress even appropriates funds to build this brand new lighthouse to replace Old Baldy. And then of course, just a few months later, Old Baldy is going to find herself in a new nation called the Confederate States of America. And that bright young engineer, William Henry Chase Whiting, of course is going to find himself serving a new nation as a general in the Confederate States military. Battery number four is the best preserved and interpreted of Fort Holmes' five batteries. And it's all thanks to a partnership between the Old Baldy Foundation and the Bald Head Association. There's a lovely boardwalk trail that traverses the battery, and there are several wayside markers that were established by the Old Baldy Foundation that helps interpret the landscape. We also have the most information about battery number four, thanks to federal topographical engineers that mapped the remains of Fort Holmes after the Federals captured Baldhead Island in January of 1865. According to those federal sources, battery number four consisted of four pieces of artillery. Three of the four were 24-pounder cannons, and the fourth was a 32-pounder cannon. Now, two out of the three 24-pounder cannons were labeled as old, in addition to the one 32-pounder. We may infer that old means that the pieces of artillery had smoothbore barrels rather than the new rifled technology. Finally, battery number four has the best preserved bombproof magazine in all of Baldhead Island. Now, a bombproof magazine were constructed by Confederate military officials and their enslaved workers in order to properly and safely store all their projectiles and gunpowder. It's basically a man-made cave used to protect those projectiles from errant cannonballs. Now this mound is clearly visible in the landscape of battery number four and has yet to be excavated. Hopefully in the future archaeologists may be able to uncover any artifacts that remain inside the magazine. All right, so we are here in what we call battery number four within Fort Holmes. So Fort Holmes is one of the last fortifications that are designed and constructed by the Confederate military in the Lower Cape Fear, uh, of course, really under the leadership of William Henry Chase Whiting. Um, they don't start constructing Fort Holmes until late 1863, and it's actually in response of Union uh, the Union Navy landing a party here in September of 1863. And after General Whiting realizes that the Union Army and Navy is interested in Baldhead Island enough to land some sailors here, he writes the authorities and says, I need reinforcements, I need the manpower to construct a fortification like Fort Holmes on Baldhead Island to protect it. I need to win the race, is what he's saying, before the Union Army and Navy constructs fortifications on this island. And uh, in the fall of 1863, he begins constructing areas of this fort and will eventually begin connecting the pieces or connecting the walls. 
and for, uh, battery number four is one of the first or original areas constructed uh, in Fort Holmes. So, so what you see uh, behind me here is actually not part of the fort's walls. This is a magazine. And there are so many magazines that are left behind across Bald Head Island on the western end of the island. This is the most uh, intact of the magazines. What's really exciting for the Old Bali Foundation is we do hope to excavate uh, this magazine eventually to learn more about the construction of Fort Holmes and uh, some of the uh, artifacts that were left behind. We are fortunate this land is uh, preserved by the Baldhead Association, the Homeowners Association, uh, in partnership with the Old Baldy Foundation. Uh, so the magazine is protected, and we're awaiting future plans to excavate uh, that magazine and, and see what the Confederates left behind for us. Hey everybody, we're back here. We're still along East Wall. So again, this is a wall constructed uh, looking eastward towards the pitch of Cape Fear, defending the island against a federal landing party that would work themselves across the island. You can see the mound here on my left and my right, but you'll notice immediately behind me, the wall is Cut, and we have these boards interpreting what we call Confederate Road. So uh, in 1863, a Confederate uh, engineer, a topographical engineer on, uh, with the last name Blackford, came over here and provides us uh, historians some really great detailed maps of what Baldhead Island looked like under Confederate occupation. And you learn from these maps that the Confederates constructed all kinds of roads through the jungle of Baldhead Island. And I mean, at first you can think, okay, well, they're using these roads to move infantry. Um, of course, uh, the ease of accessing different parts of the island. But most importantly, they're actually using these roads, like Confederate Road behind me, to move uh, Whitworth guns. So the Confederate forces here on Baldhead Island uh, had one, and we believe, at least on several occasions, had two of these Whitworth guns. This uh, this beautiful uh, piece of artillery designed by the English that used these hexagonal shells and uh, were, were breech loading uh, with an impeccable range, and they were mobile. So, as you all know, with many of these fortifications uh, in the Lower Cape Fear, uh, the artillery, the 28 inches, the, the 32 pounders, um, the, the Columbiads, they're stationary. Uh, they're placed on barbettes and um, you, you are getting them out very quickly and they're, no, they're not mobile. But here we had these mobile Whitworth pieces that mirrored the range of the other seacoast artillery pieces that were not mobile. So on so many different occasions, we have artillerymen stationed here at Fort Holmes using these roads cut throughout the island to move these Whitworth guns in various locations on the island and take pot shots at the Federal Navy on the block blockading line offshore. Uh, so that's what we're interpreting here on Confederate Road, which was the main uh, road that extended from the river out to the pitch of the cave. All right, so you got to wonder uh, who was stationed here at Fort Holmes, and it was the 40th North Carolina Infantry. Uh, they were also referred to as the 3rd North Carolina Heavy Artillery. Uh, they were trained in both infantry tactics and artillery tactics. And they were uh, encamped right in the middle of Fort Holmes in log homes they constructed in parallel lines extending from uh, Old Baldy Lighthouse. And uh, it seems like each company had their own little small village as I describe it. 
and uh, in a few moments, I'll, I'll read from a letter from Captain Charles Banson that describes what this village looked like. But it often surprises folks when they hear that the population of this island wouldn't be larger until around the 1990s, the early 1990s. There was that many people over here living in these log cabins within Fort Holmes. And it was a, a diverse a group of people and a, a diverse group of animals, as you're going to hear from Captain Charles Danson's letters. An excellent primary source describing the camps at Fort Holmes is a letter penned by Captain Charles Bonson on November 1, 1864. Captain Bonson describes the camp as, quote, the men have very good log huts, roofs, floors, bunks, fireplaces, doors, and everything in better style than I have ever seen in this army. As yet I have no quarters, but as soon as some lumber comes, we'll put up a house. Our adjutant, Lieutenant J.B. Hancock, and myself will have one together. I have made a rough sketch of our house. It will be double, with a passage between the rooms, likewise under the same roof. Very nice shingles are made on the island, and a very good job can be put up, I assure you. We have some handsome bedsteads, and at present I'll be staying in one of the rooms of Colonel Hedrick's house. Captain Bonson continues to describe the camp as, quote, We live in very good style, chinaware, silver spoons, and together with grace from Colonel Tate. The garrison on this island consists of eight companies of the 40th North Carolina Regimental Infantry and Captain William Badham's Light Infantry. The regiment is sometimes called artillery, but they drill in the infantry as well as artillery exercises. The companies are not crowded together, but are scattered inside the works with generally two companies at one place. The works extend for nearly one continuous line and are about a mile and a half in length. The companies are very full, all averaging more than 100 men each. The discipline here is much more strict than the Virginia armies. No one can pass outside the lines at night without the countersign. I can send you an old one, and you can see how they arrange them. The water here is not very good, but it might be worse. Palmetto abounds in the greatest profusion and gives the place a very tropical appearance. The bud is dried, bleached, and manufactured into hats. Many of the men are great experts, and their wives, of whom there are a number here, as well as children, are not far behind them in skill. It really does not look like a camp to see the mechanics at work, the women washing and the children playing around, mixed up in a motley crowd of dogs, cats, hogs, chickens, old and young, great and small. We have tailors and shoemakers, brick masons, carpenters, well, in fact, there are representatives from every me mechanical and mercantile pursuit. One of the privates in Company C is the proprietor of the City Hotel in Wilmington. So uh, we're moving down what we call the east wall, but we have found ourselves now at battery number three. Uh, and just as uh, kind of a big picture, there are five batteries on Baldhead Island in Fort Holmes. Four are numbered, and the fifth is named Battery Holmes. Uh, and Fort Holmes is named after uh, General Holmes who uh, got a start up in Virginia and then was transferred to the Trans-Mississippi Military District uh, by um, Jefferson Davis. Uh, but we're here at battery number three. We're still uh, on the Eastern Wall defending against an incursion or a federal landing party moving their set them and themselves across Baldhead Island towards the river to get within range of Fort Caswell and Smithville or Southport. But what's really awesome about Battery 3 and one of my favorite things to point out is that this is a crescent uh, that sticks way out. So I am standing the, on the furthest eastern part of Fort Holmes. So beyond me, it makes a crescent behind me, and then the wall shoots to my right down to the ocean and to my left up towards the marsh. And the reason battery number three is a crescent that protrudes easternly from the main east wall is to create this enfilading fire. 
meaning that if the Federals did land troops out on East Beach or out on the pitch of Cape Fear, and they attack using infantry this eastern wall, a Confederate gunner or a Confederate infantryman could fire from this protrusion, and now their cannonball or their bullet is going down the length of the line of attacking infantry rather than hitting the line of infantry perpendicular. You're going to inflict more casually shooting down the length of the line rather than perpendicular to the line. It's called enfilading fire, and that was the main purpose of building battery number three. And I'll also leave you with this is the last battery we believe constructed on Fort Holmes. They began with battery homes and battery four, batteries one and two came later, and finally they connected all five batteries by extending the wall and building battery number three. Something like Legos, I call people, or tell people. Battery number three is unique because rather than overlooking a body of water such as the Cape Fear River or the Atlantic Ocean, Battery number three overlooks the interior of Bald Head Island through the today maritime forest. Battery number three was erected by Confederate officials in order to defend Bald Head Island against federal landing parties that could have landed infantry troops on Bald Head Island's eastern beach strand and then those troops could have worked themselves across the interior of Bald Head Island towards the Cape Fear River. If any federal landing parties were able to fortify Bald Head Island in an area where their cannons would be within range of either the Cape Fear River or Oak Island, they could disrupt Confederate blockade runners going in and out of Old Inlet or even besiege the Confederate forts on Oak Island known as Fort Caswell and Fort Campbell. December of 1864, a blockade runner known as the Ella was trying to enter Old Inlet or the natural estuary of the Cape Fear River, emptying into the Atlantic Ocean, and uh, she was being chased by federal blockaders offshore. And the pilot and the captain made a joint decision that they were going to run the Ella aground on South Beach behind me here on Bald Head Island. And hopefully they could run the Ella aground within range of the Confederate cannons in batteries two and uh, one here in Fort Holmes. And those Confederate batteries could protect the remains of the Ella and Confederate soldiers stationed within Fort Holmes could salvage the war materials aboard the Ella within the protection of Fort Holmes' cannons. The Ella crashes aground on South Beach. They fortunately got it within range of the Confederate cannon here on Fort Holmes. And two captains, a Captain Charles Banson, we heard from him about what Fort Holmes looked like, and Captain William Battle. Uh, from up in Edenton, Edenton Bell Battery. They were put in charge of collecting Confederate volunteers to go out and begin salvaging these uh, war materials aboard the wreck Ella before the Federal troops could get to them. It's a race to the wreck of the Ella. The Confederates win the race, and to their surprise, the Ella is not only full of some war materials, but she is full of wine and whiskey and rum. And what do you think these Confederate soldiers do on Fort Holmes? Of course, they get all that alcohol back to the beach and they have a big old party. And one of my favorite quotes from the experience of Fort Holmes is, uh, the boy is writing home to dad and he says, even the chaplain had some pretty queer graces at the mess hall that month. So it seems like everybody participated in what I consider 
look like a giant frat party on South Beach. The enemy of the Confederate soldiers who served at Fort Holmes during the Civil War and their impressed enslaved workers were not the Federal sailors on the blockading line, but rather Baldhead Island's harsh maritime and tropical environment. Mosquitoes carried malaria and yellow fever and typhoid. The poor water supply and poor diet succumbed many a soldier and enslaved workers to dysentery and diarrhea. In fact, so many Confederate soldiers and enslaved workers died on Baldhead Island, there's a long legacy or history of uncovering the skeletal remains of soldiers and enslaved workers throughout the 20th and even into the 21st century. A very famous oral history by Captain Charles Norton Swan's daughter, Captain Charlie was a lighthouse keeper on Baldhead Island, uh, but his daughter says that they often uncovered the skeletal remains of soldiers while they were playing on the island. This legacy has occurred as recently as February of 2010, when several skeletal remains were uncovered on the Baldhead Island Club golf course during an excavation for construction purposes. The excavation and construction stopped immediately, and archaeologists in the state of North Carolina uh, uncovered the skeletal remains and determined that those remains were from the Civil War period. The purpose of Battery Homes was to defend Old Inlet, or the natural emptying of the Cape Fear River into the Atlantic Ocean, against the Federal Navy's blockade line just offshore. Battery Homes on the eastern side of the Cape Fear River acted in conjunction with Fort Caswell and Fort Campbell on the western side of the Cape Fear River, now today known as Oak Island. Unfortunately, Battery Holmes is one of the missing pieces of information about Fort Holmes, and that's because the Confederate troops destroyed much of the infrastructure within Battery Holmes when they evacuated Baldhead Island following the Second Battle of Fort Fisher. What we do know is based on federal topographical engineers mapping the remains of Battery Homes, and they were able to determine there was at least a 10-inch Columbiad and a 100-pounder Seacoast Cannon. The other six guns are unknown because they were destroyed by the time the federal topographical engineers laid eyes on those artillery pieces. We do know, however, that Battery Homes was one of the original sections of Fort Holmes. It dates to the autumn of 1863 and is predating the other four batteries located within Fort Holmes. Additionally, Battery Homes was the location of the fort's pier or dock within the Cape Fear River, which was used to ferry soldiers and supplies back and forth from the mainland to Baldhead Island. And additionally, the flagstaff for the fort was located just north of Battery Homes. This view shed overlooks the areas known as Battery Homes within Fort Homes. This was the largest of all the batteries within Fort Homes and unfortunately has been severely eroded. Today, Battery Homes sits somewhere at the bottom of the Cape Fear River where it empties into the Atlantic Ocean. This southwestern portion of Baldhead Island is notorious for erosion. In fact, the Bald Head or Barren Hill in which the island receives its namesake was in this area as well until it was severely eroded and now no longer exists.